if you studied music for a while, chances are you were told that there are certain rules that supposedly make music sound good. This is especially true in music theory or composition, in which you were probably told to follow these rules when writing music. One of the most common examples would be during part writing exercises, whereby parallel fifths and octaves are strictly prohibited. And when you ask your teacher why, they might say something like, That's how Bach did it. And so should you. Well, except that Bach didn't. At least not all the time. Even when we look at his chorales, which are known as the quintessential examples of proper part writing, they are filled with issues that would have been frowned upon in any theory class today. Parallel fifths, voice crossings, spacing issues, you name it. So why did Bach break these rules? And perhaps the more pressing question is, why are there rules in the first place that everyone is told to follow? How did they come about? To explain the rules of part writing, we have to first understand the aesthetics of music during Bach's time in the early 18th century. Take the rule of avoiding parallel fifths and octaves, for example. Music during Bach's time emphasizes the independence of musical lines. Different voices have to be distinguishable to maintain the fullness of the musical texture. And the issue with parallel fifths and octaves is parallel movements between two voices make them lose their independence and sound like one. Especially with a consonant interval of a fifth or an octave between them. Hence, they are avoided to maintain the independence of each voice, creating a more consistent overall texture. Well, to be fair to Bach, he did for the most part try to avoid these parallels, as he mainly used them when the independence between parts is arguably not as important, such as between phrases or those that involve non-chord tones. So the context around these parallels is important, and the real question we should ask ourselves is, does having parallel fifths and octaves go against the aesthetic that the music calls for? If we look at other styles of music where the independence between parts is not as important, parallel fifths and octaves are everywhere. The music of Debussy represents a detachment from tonal harmony, and parallel chords are used for coloristic effects. The power chord, a quintessential feature of rock music, requires parallel fifths and octaves to give the music a richer sound. For each of these, the function of parallel fifths and octaves serves a different purpose, which is often a necessity in those particular aesthetics of music. And here comes the central point I want to make in this video, which is, there are no rules in music. The so-called rules are just guidelines for us to consider if we want to write music in a particular style with a particular kind of aesthetic. Context is everything here. Just like how parallel fifths and octaves are frowned upon in 18th century Western European art music, as they go against the aesthetic of voice independence, they are necessary for other styles of music where parallel movements enhance a certain kind of aesthetic that kind of music calls for. So when you don't follow the so-called rules, your music is not bad. It's just not faithful to the musical style for which those rules provide a guideline. Therefore, rather than calling these rules, I would rather call them conventions or guidelines. They are followed for music to sound faithful to a particular style. And speaking of style, it's important to note that styles are not just independent silos. They often overlap across geographical and historical boundaries. And it's across these boundaries where we see the idea of musical rules fall apart. Throughout history, there are many instances whereby previously established conventions were broken by composers. Monte Verdi's music was controversial during his time as it went against the conventions of Renaissance counterpoint. 
and employed more freedom in the treatment of dissonance. It was known as the Seconda Pratica, or Second Practice, later accepted by people as a new style of composition that paved the way for Baroque music. Towards the end of the 19th century, tonality was on the brink of collapse as composers such as Satie and Debussy began experimenting with non-functional harmony. The previously established functions of tonic, dominant, and subdominant are no longer applicable, as harmony was employed more for its color rather than for its function. When we look across cultures, things we take for granted in Western music might not apply anymore. We've often been taught that the leading tone or the seventh scale degree tends to resolve up to the tonic, giving a T to DO resolution. However, in certain ragas in Hindustani and Carnatic music, the seventh scale degree behaves differently, such as in rag yaman, where it tends to skip the tonic and goes to the second scale degree when the scale is going up. There's no rule stating that the leading tone wants to go to the tonic, because it doesn't. It's just a note. It wants to go to the tonic because our ears are conditioned by Western music to believe that it should resolve upwards. And the issue with Western music education is that we often take this kind of conditioning as the law, as if things happen in music because they are universal. Students are given the impression that music is governed by a universal set of rules. The rationale behind these rules is often not explained and understood. More importantly, the context is not given to students, leading them to believe that the rules they learn apply to all kinds of music. As a composer, I've been asked many times whether I follow the so-called rules of music when I compose. Do I use parallel fifths and octaves? Do I have unresolved leading tones in my music? Well, of course I do, because I'm not writing music from the 18th century. So this kind of misconception stems from the failure to address the fact that the so-called rules of music theory are intended to imitate the style of art music from 18th century Western Europe. And even for 18th century composers, they didn't write music based on any set of rules. They merely followed the conventions of that time, and what we know as rules today are attempts by later theorists to describe the music of the past. Of course, with all this being said, I'm not saying that you can ignore all the rules of your part writing exercises, but it's important to be aware that these so-called rules are merely guidelines for us to follow if we want our music to sound a particular way. And in this case, 18th century Western European art music. As for the reason why we are focusing so much on the theory of 18th century Western European art music, when so much of the music today is already quite detached from the conventions of that time, well, that opens another can of worms, and let's save that story for another day. So what do you think about the rules in music? And if you're a musician, what experiences do you have navigating them? Leave a comment below to share your thoughts. If you enjoyed watching this video, be sure to subscribe for more music-related content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.